Top 15 Family Guy Episodes If you are brand new to our channel, we invite you to take a moment to subscribe. Just click on the lit red button as well as the gray bell. Why the bell? Well, it will let you know every time we post a new video. 15. Fifteen, North by North Quahog. Christians don't believe in gravity. North by North Quahog marked Family Guy's big return to Fox after several years of slumming it on Cartoon Network and racking up DVD sales. The show didn't seem to miss a beat, luckily. After poking fun at their own cancellation in the opening moments, the writers launched right into a new adventure that saw Peter and Lois take a romantic vacation to rekindle their marriage, while Brian and Stewie babysat Chris and Meg back home. Much of the show's best material comes from the Brian-Stewie pairing, a fact that will be reiterated many times on this list, and this episode was no exception. It was funny to see the two quickly settle into the role of a quiet, suburban married couple, and do all the things parents do, like planting cocaine in the school locker of Chris's upside-down-faced nemesis, Jake Tucker. But the real fun in this episode came from Peter's war against Mel Gibson. Desperate to reclaim his stolen reel of the Passion of the Christ to crucify this, Gibson kidnapped Lois and dragged Peter through a Hitchcock-inspired thrill ride. In the end, Gibson was destroyed by his own hubris. Rarely has a celebrity been more successfully lampooned on the show. And given how often Gibson has had public meltdowns in the years since, this episode has only become more appropriate. 14. Fourteen. I dream of Jesus. Sir, our math shows that the bird is equal to or greater than the word. Jesus is a frequent subject of Family Guy's cutaway jokes. One episode even offered an I Dream of Genie style parody of creationism that was probably inspired by this episode's title. But Jesus played a more direct role here, as Peter happened to discover the beloved religious icon working in a record store and hiding from his cranky father. Peter then convinced Jesus to reveal himself to the world again, and bask in his celebrity. That led to some memorable material, most notably a scene, where then-President George W. Bush invoked the support of Jesus, only to have the real thing show up, and give him the full Woody Allen treatment. You know nothing of me or my work. How you got to be president of anything is totally amazing. But this episode's real place in the Family Guy canon was cemented by something else entirely. The entire Jesus storyline came as a result of Peter's obsession with the Trashman song Surfin' Bird. After rekindling his love of the annoyingly catchy pop single in a 50s diner, Peter proceeded to torment his family and half of Quahog with incessant dancing, singing, and queries like Oh, haven't you heard? The more the writers pushed the gag, and the more elaborate ways Peter found to spring another round of Surfin' Bird on his family, the funnier it got. Even several seasons later, you never know when Peter might suddenly burst into song again. Unlike the dreaded Conway Twitty gag, some jokes on this show do get funnier with repetition. So 13. 13. And then there were fewer. No, his last name is Woods, but he's not made of wood. Nobody is. Family Guy got unusually ambitious for its season 9 premiere. This hour-long out episode served as an elaborate spoof of murder mysteries in general and the Agatha Christie novel, and then there were none in particular. James Woods returned to the series to play himself, inviting pretty much every major Family Guy character to his remote, seaside manor for a swanky dinner party. But once the lights went out and Woods was murdered, the guests embarked on a frantic search to find the killer in their midst. It's always nice when an episode commits to its premise, rather than drifting along and focusing more on cutaway humor. Another big part of the appeal with, and then there were fewer was the fact, 
that it featured so many recurring characters, many of whom had never appeared alongside each other before. Whether it was Carl the convenience store clerk and Tom Tucker struggling to hold a conversation or Jillian's boyfriend Derek accidentally offending Seamus the peg limbed sea captain there was a lot of memorable character interaction to be had. By the time the dust settled, several characters had died, including Muriel Goldman, Diane Simmons, and Woods himself. And while Woods eventually cheated death in a later season, the rest of the dead stayed that way. That's more than we can say for a certain hyped up season 12. 12. 12. Something, something, something dark side. Lando's not system, he's a black guy. In fact, I think he might be the only black guy in the galaxy. Something, 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 dark side was the second in the show's trilogy of Star Wars parodies. The title was taken from an earlier cutaway joke, where Emperor Palpatine discovered the formula for perfect Star Wars dialogue. And while the novelty factor from Blue Harvest wasn't really there, it was still a fun parody. The episode beats were pretty much the same as Blue Harvest, the power in the Griffin household went out, forcing Peter to entertain his family with a compressed retelling of The Empire Strikes Back. Each iconic Star Wars character was replaced by a Family Guy cast member. The core group remained the same, Chris as Luke, Peter as Han, Lois as Leia, etc. A few characters received new roles, Mort was now Lando, Joe was a probe droid, and a few new faces were added as well, Carter as Palpatine, Ernie the Giant Chicken as Boba Fett. The episode managed a balance between poking fun at the Star Wars universe and showing a reverence for one of the all-time great fantasy sagas. Highlights included Peter riding a Dondon across the icy Hoth terrain and Chris encountering the Legion of Doom headquarters in the Dagaba Swamp. It was a formula that wouldn't become played out until the third installment, It's a Trap. 11. 11. 8 Simple Rules for Buying My Teenage Daughter Ha! I got your hat. Take that, hatless. Now go back to the quad and resume your hacky sack tourney. I'm not going to lie down for some frat boy bastard with his damn Tiva sandals, and his skull bandits and his Abercrombie and Fitch long sleeve, open stitched crew neck Henley, smoking his sticky buds out of a soda can, while watching his favorite downloaded Simpson episodes every night. Yes, we all love Mr. Plow. Oh, you've got this song memorized, do you? So does everyone else. Eight Simple Rules was another early sign that Family Guy not only weathered its cancellation, but might actually be a better show for its time off the air. This episode was divided along two fronts, with Stewie becoming overly attached to his new babysitter, Laden, and Peter selling Meg to the Goldman family after racking up a huge debt at Goldman's pharmacy. Luckily, this episode came at a point where Stewie hadn't completely buried his evil megalomaniac side yet, so we got to see him wreak some terrible vengeance on Laddin's boyfriend. The rant quoted above is one of Stewie's all-time great moments on the show. Similarly, the Meg subplot came at a time when the writers were still willing to treat her like a character, and not just the show's uber-pathetic punching bag. It was amusing to watch Meg flip-flop between despising Neil Goldman and being insanely jealous when another woman caught his eye. And the conflict wrapped up with a clever X-Men parody as the Griffin staged a fake comic convention and a blue makeup clad Lois played Mystique 10. 10. Quagmire's dad. Hey, I fed your dad. It's been frustrating to watch recent Family Guy seasons and see Brian steadily devolve from being the show's voice of reason to a pretentious, unlikable jerk obsessed with writing his crappy novels. But one plus side to this character transformation is that the writers have started playing up the rivalry between Brian and Quagmire. Quagmire may be Peter's best friend, but he despises Brian. And after seeing episodes like this, it's not hard to understand why. Quagmire's dad introduced, naturally, Quagmire's father to the series. But defying expectation, Dan Quagmire wasn't a shameless horndog like his son. 
Instead, he chose to get in touch with his inner woman by getting a sex change operation. Thus was born Ida Quagmire. The episode attracted the usual sort of controversy as it lampooned a sensitive subject, although by family guy standards it was actually pretty kind to the transgender community. What makes this episode so memorable is the big twist, Brian having a one-night stand with Ida, and drawing Quagmire's wrath even worse than before. Between Brian barfing up a storm, after realizing who Ida was, reminiscent of the infamous Ipecac sequence from season 4, Quagmire beating the living daylights out of him, and Brian fighting back with the line quoted above, it was class 9. 9. Sibling Rivalry I have an appointment, to banish a white Russian from my Kremlin. Before its temporary cancellation, Family Guy introduced the character Bertram as a potential little brother for Stewie, should Peter and Lois ever make the bone-headed move of having another child. Every bit the pint-sized mad genius Stewie is, the two parted ways assuming they'd be the best of friends once Bertram was actually born. As it turns out, that wasn't the case at all. There's only room for one megalomaniacal baby in Quahog. Bertram finally achieved existence after a hilarious sequence, where Peter accidentally trashed an entire room full of sperm samples, and decided to refill them himself. Nine months and one applicator shaped like Jodie Foster's knuckles later, he went to war with Stewie for control of the playground. This episode was full of elaborate battle sequences as the two enemies clashed swords and armies of toddlers in miniature fighter jets, and Apache helicopters duked it out. The fake-out ending was pretty clever too, with Stewie turning to Soprano's character Christopher Moltisanti, to help him bury what seemed to be Bertram's body, but was in truth just a tree. The subplot involving Lois overeating, because of Peter's low sex drive was pretty memorable as well with Peter being his usual hypocritical self and telling her, Lois, men aren't fat. Only fat women are fat. That is, until Lois's extra weight brought his sex drive back. 8. 8. Meet the Quagmires. Meg, stop staring at Mr. Griffin. I'm sorry Peter, I'm afraid she has her father's libido. Meet the Quagmires wasn't the first episode to revolve around the concept of Peter doing something extra stupid, and death popping in to show him, how his life might have turned out. But this is the best use of that trope. Feeling suffocated by Lois, Peter took death up on his offer to travel back to 1984 for a day and relive his youth. Unfortunately for him, ditching Lois at their high school prom changed the future drastically, causing Al Gore to be elected president and Quagmire to marry Lois instead. This episode is worth a viewing just for the sight gag of seeing the three Griffin children with Quagmire's strong chin and swagger. But the entertainment value kept going as Peter repeatedly struggled and failed to fix his mistake in what turned into a pretty solid Back to the Future parody. The episode replicated a lot of the elements that make the Road to episode so memorable, except with Peter in place of Stewie. 7. 7. Da boom. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Look pal, I don't take coupons from giant chickens, not after that last time. Going back and watching the early episodes of Family Guy can be a little difficult now, as the show was pretty rough around the edges in its first season. Da Bomb was the first really great episode that showcased what was possible given the right outlandish premise. Airing in late December 1999, this episode showed a possible future for Quahog after the Y2K bug had wreaked havoc on the world. The Griffins encountered Randy Newman in the Wastelands, Peter discovered a vast cache of Twinkies and built new Quahog, and Stewie morphed into a radioactive squid monster who destroyed civilization all over again. The icing on the cake was the bizarre, live-action final sequence that brought Victoria Principal and Patrick Duffy into film a spoof version of the infamous ending to the Who Shot J.R. storyline on Dallas. But easily the highlight of this episode was the birth of the rivalry between Peter and Ernie the Giant Chicken. 
in what was easily the show's longest cutaway joke at the time, an expired coupon led to Peter, and an Ernie waging a furious kung fu battle that spanned several minutes and left Quahog in ruins. They've had rematches several times in the years since, with each new clash raging even bigger and longer, than the one before it. 6. 6. PTV. His chin looks like balls. You want me to cover that too? One imagines that the Family Guy crew and the FCC don't have the warmest relationship. The show often pushes the boundaries of good taste and what's acceptable to air in a TV-14 context. So PTV was probably a way for the writers to relive some tension and have a few laughs at the agency's expense. Apropos of nothing, the episode opened with a lengthy sequence of Osama bin Laden goofing his way through the filming an anti-American video, only to be attacked by Stewie, which then led into a spoof of the opening sequence to Naked Gun. That pretty much set the tone for the rest of the episode. From there, Peter had a go at running his own TV network, featuring R-rated reruns of shows like The Jeffersons and original content like Peter Griffin's side Boob Hour and Midnight Q. That led to the FCC shutting him down, and then deciding they might as well just start censoring real life too. It was an episode, where all the jokes seemed to hit on target. And it offered one of Family Guy's first elaborate song and dance numbers. These days, the musical sequences comes across more as an expensive means of filling screen time. Five. 5. Road to the Multiverse. It says that in this universe, Frank Sinatra was never born, and never used his influence to get Kennedy elected. So Nixon won the 1960 election, but totally botched the Cuban Missile Crisis causing World War III. One of the most familiar motifs on Family Guy, is the Road to, format, where Brian and Stewie team up and go on crazy adventures that take them across the globe, and occasionally time and space. This particular road to emphasized the latter too, as the duo explored the many versions of Quahog that exist in the multiverse. Among those were a Flintstones s Quahog full of rock themed sexual innuendo, a world where the Japanese won World War II, the Robot Chicken universe, a live action universe, and the universe of misleading portraiture. The plot was about as bare bones as they come, but the various bizarro world versions of Quahog never failed to entertain. There was even an elaborate sequence, where Brian and Stewie stumbled into a world of lush Disney animation, complete with talking animals, songs about pie. 4. 4. Mixtroke. This must be the McBurger Town Slaughterhouse. Sir, you are correct. But here, we call it Echo. As much as the best episode of Family Guy tend to revolve around Brian and Stewie's adventures, there are also those fueled entirely by Peter's ridiculous antics. Mixtroke is easily one of the best Peter-centric episodes. It started with Peter cycling through his latest Mr. Toad-esque mania, growing a mustache. When that failed, he eased the pain of his mustachelessness by stuffing his face full of McBurger Town burgers which led to a massive stroke that left half of his body paralyzed. This is Family Guy, so even something as serious as a stroke is played for laughs. The scene of Peter driving awkwardly down the road, and incoherently singing along with Rums It's the End of the World as We Know It, and I Feel Fine, was a definite highlight. The ridiculousness only continued as Peter instantly cured himself with stem cells, then traveled to the McBurger Town factory, and met a talking cow voiced by Ricardo Montalban. That led to a chase scene musical montage inspired by the monkeys as Peter and Brian led the whistle blowing cow to safety. That's to say nothing of the episode's subplot, which was plenty memorable in its own right. Mixtroke featured the first appearance of Stewie's bad boy alter ego, as Stewie worked to prove he could become the most popular kid at Meg's school, and had a clash with her nemesis, Connie D'Amico. 3. 3. Blue Harvest. Hold your fire, there's no life forms aboard. Hold your fire. What, are we paying by the laser now? 
To paraphrase a famous saying, when it comes to love, soup, and Star Wars parodies, the first is always the best. Blue Harvest was Family Guy's first attempt at devoting an hour-length episode to lampooning the Star Wars franchise, and it remains the best. Despite having already poked fun at the Holy Trilogy numerous times in the preceding five seasons, the show proved theirs was plenty more comedy left to mine. Blue Harvest efficiently worked its way through the events of Episode 4, taking time along the way, to also spoof everything from deal or no deal to asteroids to airplane. Through it all, the episode maintained a sense of authenticity thanks to the fact that it featured real music and visual effects from Episode 4. Even Robot Chicken couldn't boast that. Speaking of which, the final regular scene also kicked off an amusing trend of Chris, who's voiced by Robot Chicken co-creator Seth Green, trying in vain to defend Robot Chicken from the rest of the family. Robot Chicken might have gone the in-depth parody route first, but Blue Harvest succeeded on its own merits. 2. 2. Road to Rhode Island. Oh, that's it, Mr. Giraffe, get all the marmalade. If you want more proof that the first is usually the best, take the first entry in the Road to style of episodes. In this episode, Brian volunteers to pick Stewie up from his grandparents' house, only to land both of them in trouble, when his plane tickets are stolen. Thus begins a crazy road trip as the two struggle to make it back to Quahog before Lois realizes something is amiss. It was an entertaining romp, but also an emotional one. Brian took the opportunity to visit the puppy mill where he was born, which resulted in him stealing his late mother's taxidermied body. We're not always keen, when this show tries to focus too much on emotional, heartfelt moments, as more often than not it just doesn't seem genuine. But emotional drama is one area, where the show is generally better in its early, pre-cancellation seasons. Road to Rhode Island, may be the closest this series ever gets to a Jurassic Bark. 1. 1. Petterted. Hello, Sally. H. Hey, it's Peter Griffin. Yeah, that's right, senior prom. Yeah, it's been a while, so listen, um, I just found out that I'm retarded and I'm, I'm just calling to let you know that, uh, you might want to get yourself tested. Hello? In the end, we had to give the nod to Peter over Brian and Stewie. We always love a good Peter goes off the deep end episode, and none better than Petterd. It all started with Peter letting a trivial pursuit victory go to his head. But after being challenged to apply for a MacArthur Genius Grant, Peter is instead labeled as being mentally retarded. That led to a comical shift in fortunes, where first Peter lamented his ill fortune, including having to wear floaties to drain soup, then realized he could exploit his handicap to get away with anything, then managed to send Lois to the hospital and lose custody of his children to Cleveland. It was one long, hilarious saga. Given the subject matter, Petterdit came under a fair amount of scrutiny and even some censorship. This is one case where you have really seen the episode until you've watched the uncut DVD version. The show was at its comedic best with this episode, with musical numbers and family drama, to back up the offensive humor. Yeah.